Okay, finally what we want to talk about is a few issues in terms of the actual data collection. And again, some of these came up on Thursday. We can discuss them more in class on Tuesday as well. But in particular, what we're looking at is uh, um, different properties of the recording or data collection method or situation. We talked a little bit about recording the situation um, on tape and being able to go back and view it and code the behaviors or count the behaviors versus doing it live. And we also mentioned some of the pros and cons of both of these methods. Okay, When you're recording things live, it is very difficult, especially if the, the situations or the behaviors are coming very rapidly, to be accurate in your counts or to make sure that you haven't missed something. Okay, It's also a lot harder if you have multiple raters to try and come up with a, a establish some sort of inter-rater reliability by discussing questionable behaviors or questionable instances of your dependent variable um, sort of like we talked about in class on Thursday. Now with the video recording you're much more able to do that but we saw there can be some problems with that as well. Okay, Sometimes you lose a little bit of flexibility for trying to record a situation especially if you're just setting up a video camera and leaving it alone uh, and not trying to approach it or not trying to mess with it during the situation. Now if what you're doing is trying to overtly record something then what you may be doing is disguise the fact that you're recording it. Well then even if you do need to get up and move the video camera, okay, if, if that video camera is hidden then if you have to you know, reveal it in order to move to a new location for example then that is again going to compromise other situations because then you might fall prey to something like reactance uh, in your recording. So when you're recording data, there are also different types of data you can record. Now Jackson enumerates these. We're not going to discuss these a lot here because most of the time you guys are going to be using what she refers to as behavioral checklists, where there are certain behaviors that you're going to be looking for and or certain qualities uh, such as gender uh, or ethnicity of the people that you're going to be recording, Okay, rather than taking a complete narrative record um, or trying to collect some sort of qualitative data as well. Even though that's what we're going to be doing, uh, just being aware of the fact that that's not necessarily the way that observational studies need to proceed. Finally, I just want to introduce a couple different sampling methods that you can use when you're doing an observational study. Okay? And these are referred to as time sampling versus event sampling. Now the way to think about these, with time sampling what you're doing is you're usually in the observational situation for a prolonged period of time. It might be for an hour, a couple hours, half a day, sometimes even a full day. Now these aren't used so much in psychology as they are in other fields such as sociology or anthropology. Okay, But sometimes, especially when looking at um, a behavior in children, they can be as well. Now what time sampling then involves is because you're there for this long period of time, what you want to do is record, uh, let's say for one minute every five minutes. You don't want to sit there and be uh, you know, so vigilant over the entire course of a morning or a day or whatever the case may be and try and record every single thing that's happening. Okay? In this situation with time sampling, what you're doing okay, is recording all of the behaviors that are, that are occurring for these specific time intervals. So say I'm recording for one minute. I'm observing the behavior for one minute and marking down somehow everything that's happening during that one minute. And then I take a break. Okay, for a few minutes and then I record again for another minute. Now in order to avoid again any sort of bias this is done systematically so it might be that I'm recording for one minute five minute break, record another minute, five minute break, so forth and so on. Okay, now that, again that's going to be time sampling because what dictates when and how you're recording is just the passage of time. Now alternatively with event sampling what you're looking for is one specific event to occur, or in our case in psychology is one specific behavior. So there you are looking, uh, again, sort of continuously, but what you're looking for is just each time a specific thing happens, such as holding the door open for somebody, would be event sampling. Okay, So here you're looking across the entire period of time, but you're only recording one specific thing every time that it occurs. So the distinction between these two methods is in time sampling, again, you're only recording for some very small periods of time over the entire course of the situation. Okay? But what you're recording during those instances are a lot of behaviors, a lot of events that are occurring. However, in event sampling, what you're doing is just recording one or a small subset of specific events whenever they might be occurring. 
So in the latter situation, event sampling, you're going to be missing out if there are other things that later turn out to be very interesting, but you haven't recorded them because they weren't on your list of, of prescribed events or behaviors. With time sampling, however, because you're recording multiple events and multiple behaviors, then if there are relationships that you hadn't thought of, but after you record the data, you see are showing up, such as the co-occurrence of certain behaviors, okay, at these multiple points in time, then that can be an advantage of time sampling as well. So especially when you don't have maybe clear hypotheses or when you're not really sure exactly what some of the variables are that might be related in a specific situation, there you might be more inclined to use time sampling as well. Now that actually wraps up the lecture on observational methods. And again, there's not a lot of material here, uh, but there are just some specific points you wanted to get out there. And again, we can discuss some of these in class, uh, and some of them we even discussed already in relation to the video that you guys saw on Thursday. Okay, and we can also discuss how some of these are going to relate and whether they're going to be relevant for your specific observational research projects that you'll be uh, conducting over the next couple weeks as well.